Madame Pomfrey wasn't at all pleased. You should have come straight to me, she raged, holding up a sad limp rem remainder of what, half an hour before, had been a working arm. I can mend bones in a second, but growing them back, you will be able to, won't you? said Harry desperately. Oh, I'll be able to, certainly, but it will be painful, Madam, said Madam Pomfrey gr grimly, throwing Harry a pair of pajamas. You'll have to stay the night. Hermione waited outside the curtain drawn around Harry's bed while Ron helped him into his pajamas. It took a while to stuff the rubbery, boneless arm into a sleeve. How can you stick up for Lockhart now, Hermione, huh? Ron called through the curtain as he pulled Harry's limp fingers through the cuff. If Harry had wanted deboning, he would have asked. Anybody can make a mistake, said Hermione, and it doesn't hurt anyone do anymore, does it, Harry? No, said Harry, getting into bed, but it doesn't do anything else either. As he swung himself onto the bed, his arm flapped point pointlessly. Hermione and Madame Pomfrey came around the curtain. Madame Pomfrey was holding a large bottle of something labeled Skelligro. You're in for a rough night, she said, pouring out a, ste a steaming beaker full and handing it to him. Regrowing bones is a nasty business. So was taking the Skelligro. It burned Harry's mouth and throat as it went down, making him cough and splutter. Still tut-tutting about dangerous sports and inept teachers, Madame Pomfrey retreated, leaving Ron and Hermione to help Harry gulp down some water. We won, though, said Ron, a grin breaking across his face. And that was some catch he made. Malfoy's face, he looked ready to kill. I want to know how he fixed that bludger, said Hermione darkly. We can add that to the list of questions we'll ask him when we've taken the polyjuice potion, said Harry, sinking back into his pill onto his pillows. I hope it tastes better than this stuff. If it's got if it if it's got bits of Slytherin in it, in it you've got to be joking, said Ron. The door to the hospital wing burst open at that moment. Filthy and soaking wet, the rest of the Gryffindor team had arrived to see Harry. Unbelievable flying, Harry, said George. I must have seen Marcus Flint yelling at Mal... I... Uh, let me try that again. Unbelievable flying, Harry, said George. I've just seen Marcus Flint yelling at Malfoy. Something about having the snitch on top of his head and not noticing? Malfoy didn't seem too happy. They brought... They had brought cakes, sweets, and bottles of pumpkin juice and gathered around Harry's bed and were just getting started on what promised to be a good party when Madame Pomfrey came storming over, shouting, the, This boy needs rest. He's got 33 bones to regrow. Out! Out! And Harry was left alone with nothing to distract him from the stabbing pains in his limp arm. Hours and hours later, Harry woke quite suddenly in the pitch blackness and gave a small yelp of pain. His arm now felt full of large splinters. For a second, he thought that what was uh, he thought that was what had woken him. Then, in a thrill with a thrill of horror, he realized that someone was sponging his forehead in the dark. "Get off!" he said. Then, "Dobby!" The house elf's goggling tennis ball eyes were peering at Harry through the darkness. A single tear was running down his long, pointed nose. Harry Potter came back to school, he mis whispered miserably. Dobby warned and warned Harry Potter. Ah, oh, sir, why didn't you heed Dobby? Why didn't Harry Potter go back home when he missed the train? Harry heaved himself up on his pillows and pushed Dobby's sponge away. What are you doing here, he said, and how did you know I missed the train? Dobby's lip trembled and Harry was seized by a sudden su suspicion. It was you, he said slowly. You stopped at the barrier from letting us through. Indeed, yes, sir, said Dobby, nodding his head vigorously, his, his ears flapping. Dobby hid and watched for Harry Potter and sealed the gateway, and Dobby had to iron his hands afterward. He showed Harry ten long bandaged fingers. 
But Dobby didn't care, sir, for he thought Harry Potter was safe. And never did Dobby dream that Harry Potter would get to school another way. He wa was rocking backward and forward, shaking his ugly head. Dobby was so shocked when he heard Harry was back at the Hogwarts. He let his master's dinner burn. Such a flogging Dobby never had, sir. Harry slumped back onto his pillows. You nearly got Ron and me expelled, he said fiercely. You'd better get lost before my bones come back, Dobby, or I might strangle you. Dobby smiled weakly. Dobby is used to death threats, sir. Dobby gets them at least five times a day at home. He blew his nose on a corner of his filthy pillow of the filthy pillowcase he wore, looking so pathetic that Harry felt his anger ebb away in spite of himself. Why do you wear that thing, Dobby? he asked curiously. This, sir, said Dobby, plucking at the pillowcase. Tis the mark of the house elf's enslavement, sir. Dobby can only be freed if his master pre masters present him with clothes, sir. The family is careful not to pass Dobby even a sock, sir, for then he would be free to leave their house forever. Dobby mopped his bulging eyes and said suddenly, Harry Potter must go home. Dobby thought his bludger would be enough to make your bludger, said Harry, his anger rising once more. What do you mean your bludger? You made that bludger try and kill me? Not kill you, sir. Never kill you, said Dobby, shocked. Dobby wants to save Harry Potter's life. Better sent home, grievously injured, than remain here, sir. Dobby only wanted Harry Potter hurt enough to be sent home. Oh, is that all, said Harry angrily. I don't suppose you're going to tell me why you wanted me to sent, wanted me sent home in pieces. Oh, if Harry Potter only knew, Dobby groaned, more tears dripping onto the ragged pillowcase. If he knew what he means to us, to the lowly, the enslaved, we dregs of the magical world. Dobby remembers how it was when he who must not be named was at the height of his power, sir. We house elves were treated like vermin, sir. Of course, Dobby is still treated like that, sir, he admitted, drying his face on his pillowcase. But mostly, sir, life has improved for my kind since you triumphed over he who must not be named. Harry Potter survived, and the Dark Lord's power was broken. And it was a new dawn, sir, and Harry Potter shone like a beacon of hope for those of us who thought the dark days would never end, sir. And now, at Hogwarts, terrible things are to happen, are perhaps happening already. And Dobby cannot let Harry Potter stay here now that history is to repeat itself, now that the Chamber of Secrets is open once more. Dobby froze, horror-struck, then grabbed Harry's water jug from his bedside table and cracked it over his own head, toppling out of sight. A second later, he crawled back onto the bed, cross-eyed, muttering, Bad Dobby. Very bad Dobby. So there is a chamber of secrets, Harry whispered. And did you say it's been opened before? Tell me, Dobby. He sees the bony... His, the, uh. He sees the elf's bony wrist as Dobby's hand inched toward the water jug. But I'm not muggle-born. How can I be in danger from the chamber? Ah, oh, sir, ask no more. Ask no more of poor Dobby, stammered the elf, his eyes huge in the dark. Dark deeds are planned in this place, but Harry Potter must not be here when they happen. Go home, Harry Potter, go home. Harry Potter must not meddle in this, sir. "'Tis too dangerous.' "'Who is it, Dobby?' Harry said, keeping a firm hold on Dobby's wrist to stop him from hitting himself with the water jug again. "'Who's opened it? Who opened it last time?' "'Dobby can't, sir. Dobby can't. Dobby mustn't tell,' squealed the elf. "'Go home, Harry Potter. Go home.' 
I'm not going anywhere, said Harry fiercely. One of my best friends is Muggleborn. She'll be first in line if the chamber has, really has been opened. Harry Potter risks his own life for his friends, moaned Dobby in a kind of miserable ecstasy. So noble, so valiant, but he must save himself. He must. Harry Potter must not. Dobby suddenly froze, his bat ears quivering. Harry heard it too. There were footsteps coming down the passageway outside. Dobby must go, breathed the elf terrified. There was a loud crack and Harry's fist was suddenly clenched on thin air. He slumped back into bed, his eyes on the dark doorway to the hospital wing as the footsteps drew nearer. Next moment, Dumbledore was backing into the dormitory, wearing a long woolly dressing gown and a nightcap. He was carrying one end of what looked like a statue. Professor McGonagall appeared a second later, carrying its feet. Together, they heaved it onto a bed. Get Madame Pumphrey, whispered Dumbledore, and Professor McGonagall hurried past the end of Harry's bed out of sight. Harry lay quite still, pretending to be asleep. He heard urgent voices, then Professor McGonagall swept back into view, closely followed by Madame Pomfrey, who was pulling a cardigan over her nightdress. He heard a sharp intake of breath. What happened? Madame Pomfrey whispered to Dumbledore, bending over the statue on the bed. Another attack, said Dumbledore. Minerva found him on the stairs. There was a bunch of grapes next to him, said Professor D McGonagall. We think he was trying to sneak up here to visit Potter. Harry's stomach gave a horrible lurch. Slowly and carefully, he raised himself a few inches so he could look at the statue on the bed. A ray of moonlight lay across its staring face. It was Colin Creevy. His eyes were wide and his hands were stuck up in front of him, holding his camera. Petrified, whispered Madame Pomfrey. Yes, said Professor McGonagall, but I shudder to think... If Albus hadn't been on his way on the way downstairs for hot chocolate, who knows what might have. The three of them stared down at Colin. Then Dumbledore leaned forward and wrenched the camera out of Colin's rigid grip. You don't think he managed to get a picture of his attacker? said Professor McGonagall eagerly. Dumbledore didn't answer. He opened up the back of the camera. Good gracious, said Madame Pomfrey. A jet of steam had hissed out of the camera. Harry, three beds away, caught the ac ac mm, acrid smell of burnt plastic. Melted, said Madame Pomfrey wonderingly. All melted. What does this mean, Albus? Professor Dum or McGonagall asked urgently. It means, said Dumbledore, that the Chamber of Secrets is indeed open again. Madame Pomfrey clapped a hand over to her mouth. Professor McGonagall stared at Dumbledore. But Albus, surely... Who? The question is not who, said Dumbledore, his eyes on Colin. The question is, how? And from what Harry could see of M Professor McGonagall's shadowy face, she didn't understand this any better than he did.